my name's uh, Paul Wibley. I'm the director of uh, SAS. I'd like to welcome all of you who've uh, come here tonight. It's a full house. Then was saying to me earlier, she was a bit nervous. And I blame her family. <laughs> I was asking who was here. She said, well, there's my husband and there's my mother and there's my father and cousins and all these other people. And they're here to witness what will be a great occasion. So thank you all very much for coming, all the friends, all the relatives. And I have to say, it's the first time I've seen a standing ovation before the talk. <laughs> so this makes it a very special occasion indeed. Now, to just make sure it's enjoyable, I do have to ask you to turn off your mobile phones. Uh, people who often attend these things know that I'm hopeless at doing this myself, which is why, well, oh, look, I'm learning. I've done it. OK, good. So turn off your mobile phone, please. There's no plans to uh, have a fire drill, given that we're not peculiar like that. Uh, that would be a cruel thing to do. So if the fire alarm does go off, the fire exits are labelled fire exit. OK. Uh, I'm very pleased to preside over this uh, inaugural lecture. It's the third one of 2013. I'm really looking forward to it, as I know we all are, because Lynn is someone I greatly admire. When she was head of the School of Law, she was always clear, forthright, cogent, and compelling. And lots of other positive things as well. So I'm really looking forward to this evening. And I'm sure all those qualities will be on display this evening in her talk. Now, Lynn will be introduced by Dr. Zeba Mir Hassini, who's a legal anthropologist specialising in Islamic law, gender and development. She's a research associate at SAS's Centre for Islamic and Middle Eastern Law. She's held numerous research fellowships and visiting professorships. She's a founding member of the Masawa Global Movement for Equality and Justice in the Muslim Family, and as well as publishing numerous books, she's also directed, with Kim Longanotto, two award-winning feature-length documentary films on contemporary issues in Iran, Divorce, Iranian Style, and Runaway. The uh, vote of thanks will be given by Professor Anne Nahim, who will in, who, he's the Charles Howard Candler Professor of Law at Emory University, an internationally recognised, internationally famous scholar of Islam and human rights, and human rights in cross-cultural perspectives in particular. His research interests include constitutionalism in Islamic and African countries, secularism, Islamic and politics, and his current project includes a study of American Muslims and the secular state, human rights, universality and sovereignty. We're very grateful to you both for being here uh, this evening, helping us make this such a great occasion. Thank you very much indeed. After the end, you'll all be invited up to the uh, Brunei suite for some wine and canapes. And I say that now because sometimes at the end, people sort of stand around thinking, and now? So the end is upstairs for the reception. So to introduce Professor Lynn Welch, I'm now going to pass over to Zeba. Over to you, Zeba. When Lynn asked me to introduce her for her inaugural lecture, I was very moved and honored and gladly accepted. But soon I realized that it's not going to be an easy job. Many of us today will know what I mean when I say it is hard to capture the breadth and the depth of Lynn's scholarship and achievement let alone to convey what an extraordinary person she is. Her dynamism, courage, her energy, and the way she both lights up and energizes any room, any gathering that she enters. Let me start with some biographical de details that may not be familiar to some of us. One of Lynn's characteristics is that she does not dwell on the past but is always with us in the present and looking to the future. So I had really to do some research before introducing her. Lynn studied Arabic and Persian for the BA in Cambridge, Clare College. After graduating with a first class degree in 1982, she taught for a year at Berzit University in Palestine. Then she joined al Haq one of the first human rights NGOs in the Arab world as a researcher. This was the beginning of, the 15, of a 15 years association with human rights organization in the Arab world and elsewhere, including working with 
Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, and the International Federation of Human Rights Leagues. This association continues until this day and enriches her scholarship and the immense sense of purpose and energy that she devotes to whatever she takes up. It was in Palestine and her experience there working with women and human rights group that brought Lynn to law and prompted her to pursue postgraduate studies. She was wisely advised by her Cambridge supervisor, late Martin Hind, to come to SOAS, where in 1985 she completed uh, with distinction the SOAS certificate in comparative law and proceeded to take on a PhD which she pursued while continuing work with NGOs, as well as serving as visiting lecturer in the Institute of Women's Studies in Berzit University. And the Institute was just born at that time. In 1993, she was awarded her doctorate for her pioneering study of Islamic family law in the occupied West Bank, an area of research in which she soon became an authority. There followed a series of important posts in the international organizations and women's human rights NGOs in Palestine and elsewhere, including two years as interim coordinator for the International Council of Human Rights Policy, which is an independent organization that had started its work and only closed on in early 2012 after 14 years of valuable research. This was the post that Lynn left in 1997 to join the law department of SOAS as lecturer, bringing, her not, bringing with her not only her valuable scholarship in law and in Islamic law and human rights law as well, but also her unrivaled experience of 15 years of work in the field. At SOAS, Lynn has served as head of department, as director and now deputy director of CIMIL, the Center for Islamic and Middle Eastern Law, and as convener of International uh, Human Rights Clinic. She has organized and taught several courses, including Islamic law, law and society in the Middle East and North Africa, as well as human rights and Islamic law. She has secured uh, two grants for two major research projects at CIMIL. The first was a project on Islamic personal law in collaboration with Professor Al Naim at Emory University. The second was a five year project co directed with Sarah Hussein, the Bangladeshi High Court barrister and activist, for research on strategies of response to crimes of honor as violence against women. This project brought a number of young and established researchers uh, to SOAS to work with Lynn and turned her office into a hub of activity and meeting, meeting place for ideas and inspiration that was to live in a book that uh, Lynn and Sarah Hossein co-edited, Honor Crimes, paradigms and violence against women. Externally, Lynn is a member of editorial boards of numerous important journals and book series. She is also a trustee of the International Center for the Legal Protection of Human Rights and the Euro -Med Mediterranean Human Rights Foundation. In addition to all this activity, Lynn has also managed to keep up a tremendous output of publication. Apart from a long list of articles and book chapters, she has herself written or edited six major books on Muslim family law, human rights, and violence against women, all of which have been well received. Some of them are used as textbooks, and some of them have been the, uh, had the attention of the media as well. Let me conclude with a more personal note about two main contexts in which I have come to know Lynn and admire uh, and value her as a friend and a colleague. First, for several years now, on Lynn's invitation, I have been teaching on two of her courses. 
I'm still amazed that every year, after the first two sessions, she knows the name of every single student, their interests, where they come from, and what they want to do. And the way that she really combines academic rigor with humanity and with humor. Secondly, I was, as Paul mentioned, founding member of Musawa, a movement for equality and justice in the Muslim family, launched exactly four years ago in Kuala Lumpur under the auspices of the well-established NGO Sisters in Islam. In 2010, Musawa started a long-term multifaceted initiative to rethink the notion of male authority in Muslim legal tradition and practice. And Lynn and I, I have been working closely together on this project. At the first meeting uh, for this project, which was in Cairo, a number of uh, invited Islamic scholars from Al-Azhar took offense at some statements by project members. But Lynn, with her perfect Arabic, her erudition and sense of humor smoothly diffused the tension and we were able to proceed with the discussion. In our collaboration, I have come to value and admire and cherish Lynn's integrity her generous, generosity and courage, and her insistence on justice. And at, at the time, at the same time, more than everything else, her in-betweenness, her extraordinary capacity to navigate different intellectual, political, and geographical spaces, and make her impact in each. These qualities have shaped her valuable scholarship and her great contribution to the cause of justice and human rights. Lynn has been friend, mentor, colleague, teacher, and ally for many of us here, as well as source of hope and inspiration in dark and difficult moments. Director, ladies and gentlemen, it is my great honor and pleasure to ask Professor Lynn Welshman to deliver her inaugural lecture, Human Rights and the Middle East, a thousand and one stories starting with Palestine. Organized, <laughs> sorry. I have two things, sorry. Glasses. And talk. <laughs> yes. Oh, I didn't mind about the stick, but I thought I would forget any of this. Thank you very much, Zeba. Um, and thank you, all of you, for coming and for that clap. I'm almost crying before I start, but I shall um, <clears throat> warm up. Uh, Thank you to Paul Webley and Abdullah Naim in advance and for coming all the way. And thank you to my, the serried ranks of my family and friends up there and, and in the, elsewhere in the audience, many friends. I'm going to start now. I should start by saying that some of you may have assumed, this, that's the right one, huh? that the Thousand and One Stories, which is the title tonight, is supposed to invoke that classic work, The Thousand and One Nights or The Arabian Nights, which you'll... It's a very soas way to start in a way, but I wouldn't want to tread on any toes in Faculty of Languages and Cultures if anybody's here, so I won't. But there is a new translation in which the introduction by Robert Irwin tells us that in this work, the stories are full of echoes and half echoes of one another, like recurrent dreams in which the landscape is thoroughly familiar, though what is to come is utterly unpredictable. One story frames another, which in turn contains another within it, and so on. The French refer to this sort of framing procedure as the mise en abîme, the thrust into the abyss. Irwin makes the point that in the end, this is similar to the stories we all carry within us, to all the stories of all human life. And it's certainly immediately applicable to human rights stories. The echoes and half-echoes, the unfinished overlap, and indeed unfinished business, 
the utter unpredictability, sometimes involving unintended consequences, and even, or perhaps especially in human rights, the thrust into the abyss or many abysses that people see. But in fact, the 1001 reference in my title was chosen not with this classic work in mind, but rather with typical academic humility, my own first human rights publication. A text, <laughs> sorry, well, it's true, a text that compared with the Arabian Nights is admittedly less well known and indeed considerably shorter. <laughs> my text was entitled A Thousand and One Homes, Israel's Demolition and Sealing of Houses in the Occupied Palestinian Territories. That title was itself intended to be evocative. Every one of those 1,001 Palestinian homes demolished or sealed over the period 1981 to 1991, three quarters of them during the first four years of the first Palestinian Intifada, framed the stories of the thousands of individuals and families directly affected by this policy. There were homes, after all. This little book was published in 1993 by the Palestinian human rights organization Al Haq in support of their campaign against punitive house demolition for security reasons. The stories I want to invoke tonight, and I know I don't have time for a thousand, even if I speak as fast as I normally do, which I'm trying not to. I actually need some. If you just talk amongst yourselves a minute, I do need some water. Sorry. I want to talk about... Um, see? I'm really getting close to it. Very good. Some of the many people I know in the Middle East, including the founders of Al-Haq, who defied and continue to defy the dissonance of often implied in the coupling of human rights in the Middle East. You know, you get this human rights in the Middle East. The insistence on the challenges that face the integration of one with the other, challenges that include the meanings of human rights and who says what they are, the tenacity of the politically, socially, and economically powerful, the selectivity of the human rights agenda co-opted by powerful Western states, or the substance of the academic critique of the human rights project. And it's important to note, I'm not party to or encouraging of what academic critics have called the triumphalist narrative of human rights, or the role the discourse has come to play in its association with power. But the human rights practitioners of whom I speak tonight are not, believe me, in the least triumphal, given what's happening. They're not triumphal, and it is well, I think, to recall some of their earlier stories, given the ongoing challenges. It may simply be that those who hear only the triumphalist narrative in human rights are not talking to the same people that I talk to. Al-Haq was the first Palestinian human rights organization established in Ramallah in 1979. And my discussion today draws on the work of those early days. So that's mostly framed and focused on the West Bank um, legally and territorially at the time. I worked for Al-Haq in various capacities, as Ziba said, and over various periods from 83 to 93, and like many others, I feel I've never really left. The 80s were very intense, and we led up to the first intifada in 1987. And I learned a huge amount about the challenges and the possibilities of human rights, about research, and about be building collegial relationships as a foreigner, and given the history, particularly in Palestine, as a Brit and in the wider Middle East. I learned my first law at Al-Haq. It's all their fault, right? <laughs> And just in case I was beginning to think I had actually left, my main research and writing effort over the past three years has been drafting a history of Al-Haq's early beginnings and its, its, its formative years, which I was asked to, asked to write by the organization. It, it reached this 30-year anniversary, and they said, will you write? I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm late. In case anyone from Al-Haq is watching, it's, I'm this close to finishing. I'm just saying it will be on YouTube. And all my PhD students know what that means. I'm this close to finishing, right? Final draft, I'm this close to submission. So... So to situate myself a bit, I ended up at Al-Haq because of two particular incidents at university at Cambridge. And these, of course, are entirely subjective memories that have become part of my own history, but are likely to be remembered differently, if indeed at all, by others. With that caveat, at the Cambridge University Amnesty International Group, I invited a speaker to address the situation of Palestinian university students in the occupied territories. And she was heckled. I mean, nobody got heckled at the Amnesty Group. We were terribly earnest, and, you, you know, we didn't heckle, usually. But this was an issue where the identity of the rights bearers apparently affected their very right to claim, and that stuck. And then in my final year, by then I was involved with the Palestine Society, I was involved in an effort to twin Cambridge with Birzeit University in the West Bank. It was overambitious, it's true. <laughs> it was 1982. The year Israel was to invade Lebanon, and unsurprisingly for those days, we were roundly defeated 
As I recall it, the argument would be lost when someone would stand up and say, yes, well, of course, I agree with all that in principle, but what about the PLO? And it was like, you know that Monty Python bit with the Spanish Inquisition? I think, well, it's just, that's how I remember, how the, the phrasing would go, you know. But more seriously, the suggestion that Beers 8 was some kind of hotbed of terrorist activity reflected both the assumption that the argument of Israeli security could trump even the principle of Palestinian rights and the then very common conflation of Palestinian nationalist aspiration and activity, such as students raising the flag, with terrorism. Now, I really don't like losing arguments, especially if votes are involved. So after I finished my degree, I left the Beers 8. I thought, I'll go out and come back and I'll say, no, 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 it's not really. This was against the immediate background of the massacre at Sabra and Shatila. And in Ramallah, I found Al-Hap. And now, as I said, my current research involves looking back at those times, at the start of the Palestinian rights movement, and it has been the most difficult piece of writing I've ever done. I know I've already said I'm late, and it's already, it's, it's too long, but everybody here knows that as well, so. There are so many stories from the energy of collective endeavor, conviction born of principle, bewildering defeats and bitter losses, exasperating political contingencies, the many small wins that were not small at all for the individual concerned, and also, Inevitably, as a researcher who was herself involved, however peripherally, with the work of the organization during that time, I've come up against the issue of insider-outsider, or what um, Zeba said, in betweeny. What did you say? It wasn't in between Insider-outsider in a very direct way. Being a foreigner working for a Palestinian human rights organization was something I did think about at the time. And the role of foreign researchers and the extent to which al haq especially in its early days, was dependent on their contribution for its output, particularly in English, on the law. Um, was certainly something that the, the founders worried about in the early years in the organization. And, oh, excuse me, I'd have to sort of bring up my positioning sometimes when I was doing interviews for this study, and I had to sort of volunteer inside out, being, you know, being a, not being, obviously, being a Brit, when I was discussing with former colleagues, Palestinian colleagues from Al-Haq, and I got two responses. I was told, you know, Lynn, I never really thought of you as a foreigner, which is very nice. You know, sort of. And then I had, you know, Lynn, I never really thought of you as a researcher, which was <laughs> <laughs> not quite as reassuring, frankly. Um, still, well, I, I'm sure it was meant well. It just it didn't. I, still, among the things that have struck me in doing this particular piece of research is the intense contingency of the initiative taken by those who founded Al Haq. A few people in a particular place at a particular time, acting from a need to find creative and practical ways to respond, framed by a set of particular political developments and an opening prospect for solidarity, which is what the human rights movement was giving. And given the fact that two of them were practicing lawyers, they chose to act through the law. The law, with its association with power and the powerful, the authorities who make it and enforce it. And in the case of Palestine, not only under the British mandate, but Israel's much insisted commitment to the rule of law. Did I just lose my space? No. Yeah. In the occupied Palestinian territories, this presented more as rule by law, with hundreds of military orders regulating and restricting almost every aspect of public and economic life and legalizing the alienation of Palestinian land to further Israeli settlement policy. And, as in the case of the 1945 Defense Emergency Regulations, which were originally issued by the British Mandate authorities, who tried them out before in Ireland, some of them in the 1920s, they were providing for draconian punishments, including house demolition, for Palestinians who resisted the occupiers' agenda. And then again, the law, with its potential for empowerment and protection against the powerful, particularly when the powerful take the law seriously, or at least when they're obliged to take it seriously. Now, international human rights law, of course, started from that premise, the constraint of governments in their treatment of people under their control. al haqs focus on the law was not an obvious one then. It may seem obvious now. It wasn't obvious then. And there are those who feel that the legalistic focus of much professional human rights work today obscures the more movement-based, value-driven impetus in its origins and in much of its more popular manifestations. But it's easy to, easy to forget just how quickly the visibility of human rights and the need of international law and the NGO movement associated with their promotion have grown in a relatively short space of time to become an integral part of public discourse and at least in some part of policy making. And at the same time, and this is what concerns many of us, the manner that human rights policy is invoked by policymakers in powerful Western states such as this one in their foreign relations is one of the major challenges to local human rights groups and actors in the Middle East. It, it's hugely complicated, complicating. 
The selectivity of this discourse feeds directly into arguments, well, I'm paraphrasing here, that human rights is a hegemonic discourse that oils the engine of Western neo-imperialism. And I've heard, I mean, that's, that's, that's the, the broad thrust of it. And it has a lot of, um, that dreadful word, traction. Is that a traction? In April 2011, I had the privilege of being at one of the very first seminars bringing together human rights and democracy activists and academics from different countries of North Africa and the Middle East after two authoritarian Arab rulers, both close allies of the West for decades, had been forced from power by popular protests that you will know were already being termed then the Arab Spring. There, I heard a formidable, uh, remarkable, formidable Tunisian human rights activist, and he told the meeting that European Union human rights policy towards North Africa had been a spectacular failure. He said, we're was speaking in French, it sounds better in French, actually, but spectacular failure. The Tunisians and others in the region had for decades asserted claims to protection guaranteed under human rights law, in practice despite EU conduct, and not because of it. The Tunisian League for Human Rights was, by most assessments, the first politically independent human rights group to be established in the region, Middle East, North Africa, um, in 1977. And Al-Haq was the second. There were challenges that groups in North Africa and Al-Haq had in common, and there were others that were very different. The major st structural difference, of course, was that Al-Haq was working in a situation of military occupation. Am I reading too fast? <laughs> Who said yes? <laughs> We're all heading for the reception, you've all said this. <laughs> the major structural difference between Al Haq and groups elsewhere in the Middle East, North Africa then, well, and now, was that Al Haq was working in a situation of military occupation, with no national government accountable, not even theoretically, to the Palestinian population. In that situation, whom do you address with your demands for correction and remedy? Within a few years of its establishment, Al-Haq had developed a method of intervening with the Israeli military authorities on particular issues. But this, I mean, you're looking, it seems so obvious, but it really wasn't straightforward inside the organization. For the Palestinian population, the Israeli authorities had no legitimacy. You addressed them if you had to. You had to get a permit for the myriad permits that you needed to conduct daily life or travel or whatever, or to find out what had happened to son or daughter after they'd been arrested. But to address the occupying power voluntarily, as it were, on matters of law and policy was controversial even inside the organization to start with. The question, if you address the occupying authorities, did that mean you recognized them? You accorded them some form of recognition? As someone told me, any contact with the occupier was seen as immoral. It was weird. It wasn't done. And here, immoral goes to the principle of not recognizing or cooperating with your occupation, while weird reflects not only the absence then, total absence, of what was to become a standard form of human rights practice, not just al haq it was developing everywhere, but also to the idea that there could be any point in raising issues of rights and legal principle with the forces responsible for their violation. Partly, this was to do with the unfamiliarity of the human rights discourse, language, at that time, which was a challenge Al-Haq shared with the Tunisian League and other groups that were to be set up in the next few years in other Arab states. In the late 70s and early 80s, according to Waltz, Tunisian leftists commonly dismissed human rights as a bourgeois notion and generally American. Crystal has observed that the Arab nationalist left generally saw human rights as an issue of Western origin designed to deflect concern from economic and social issues, and indeed, one of the concerns of Southern Human Rights Group in regard to most of the international groups which based in the West was the international group's um, focus on violations of individual civil and political rights and a lack of attention to structural factors that underlay and perpetuated those violations. The ICJ, the International Commission of Jurists, was something of an exception. One of the reasons that Al-Haq was set up as the ICJ's West Bank affiliate. I don't think it was chance. Uh, politically, the Helsinki Accords had just come in to frame East-West Cold War relations, and U.S. President Jimmy Carter had committed himself to human rights as a centerpiece of U.S. foreign policy. Throwing himself into intense Middle East peace efforts, Carter hosted the signing of the 1978 Camp David Accords, that's important to remember, between Israel and Egypt. The Accords provided for the withdrawal of Israeli settlements and military forces from Egypt's Sinai Peninsula and for the implementation of autonomy or self-rule arrangements for the Palestinians of the occupied territories, with the exception of occupied East Jerusalem, which Israel had annexed unlawfully. 
The PLO was based in Lebanon to remove to Tunis after Israel's 1982 invasion of Lebanon and siege of Beirut. And it was the fact that Arab governments were not only seen to stand by during that episode, but also repressed demonstrations by their own nationals against the Israeli action that, according to Joe Stork, prompted human rights to take organizational form in Egypt. The PLO had not been a party to Camp David, and nor had the Palestinian population been consulted, and Egypt's declared goal of achieving Israel's agreement to Palestinian self-determination was not realized. The Camp David Accords were widely protested in the territories, and the co-optation of the language of human rights by the US president hardly had the effect of legitimizing the discourse in the region. For his part, Carter never entirely dis disengaged from the area into which he had put so much energy, and with so few of the results that he had apparently in good faith anticipated. The title of Jimmy Carter's 2006 book, Palestine, Peace, Not Apartheid, is designed to, promote, to provoke a primarily US audience into acknowledging the reality of what he calls abominable oppression today in the occupied territories. As was the case with its Arab counterparts, the fledging al-Haq was concerned from the outset with survival. The difference here was the matters on which the relevant authorities would act to foreclose activities and close the organization down and arrest. In the case of Palestine, this was essentially any indication of activity deemed to be manifesting nationalism, Palestinian nationalism. Membership of any faction in the PLO and any contact with the organization was illegal, and all manner of activities expressive of nationalism were criminalized, including raising the flag. In the words of the late Gabi Baramki, who for 19 years was acting president of Birzeit University, whenever someone raised the Palestinian flag, which was often, the military would intervene. It was a symbolic action, the students' way of asserting themselves as Palestinians. The flag fluttering in the air affirmed our presence. Besides the reactions of the occupying power, the founders of the young al-Haq had also to contend with a complex internal political situation. Broader speaking, this is sort of shared by their counterparts elsewhere in the Middle East and North Africa, the idea of pursuing human rights work independent of political affiliation, which is not the same as saying that human rights is not political in the grander scheme of things, although that's something that's said more easily these days than, than it is now. The movement also has moved on, the human rights movement. But in the West Bank and Gaza at that time, political affiliations were very closely drawn. And in the absence of lawful organized political parties, that was all unlawful under the Israeli occupation and the military orders, party politics were conducted through other structures. And there was a resulting tendency to ascribe to any group or organization a political character in the sense of associating it and those who ran it or worked with it or directed it mostly uh, with a particular PLO faction or alternatively with loyalty to the Jordanian regime in the West Bank or to more dubious parties, foremost among these the CIA. This was a particular challenge in the effort by al-Haq to be and to be seen both as non-political and as non-partisan. Unlike its counterparts in Tunisia, Egypt, and Morocco, Al-Haq was not a membership organization. Rather than seeking to draw in a range of political actors in support, so the other groups tended to get uh, well-known politicians from all different sort of sides and parties and have them as advisory councils or executive and so on in order to give this, to, to prove that actually it was not affiliated to a particular one. What Al-Haq did was to um, uh, not be a membership organization, and it sought to create amongst its staff members a cadre of human rights activists inside the organization. But still people asked, are they PFLP or are they CIA? Or are they what? People, oh, PFLP is Popular Front for Liberation of Palestine. I forget, not everybody knows all these acronyms. A worker from the 1980s told me that he remembers before he joined Al-Haq wondering about the people behind Al-Haq and thinking maybe they were liberals. <laughs> And as a Palestinian Marxist, liberals wasn't a term of endearment. I think it's not amongst many students these days, but that's a different country and a different time, and I'm talking here. But then, this particular worker read Al-Haq's Arabic translation of the ICJ's 1966 text, The Rule of Law, and concluded that the concept was not, in fact, in conflict with his commitment to what he called the bigger national cause of the people's liberation and self-determination. There's two related issues that arise here. The first is Al-Haq's relationship with the ICJ, the International Commission of Jurists, and its rule of law focus, which is too much to go into now, but it's, it was quite distinct from the idea of human rights per se to start with, and the link to or lack of conflict with the cause of self-determination. The then Secretary General of the International Commission of Jurists, Neil McDermott, 
was very differently placed to his Palestinian colleagues, and he came from a background in politics, in fact, in the British Labour Party. Just after Al-Haq had become the ICJ's West Bank affiliate in 1979, McDermott made a presentation at UN headquarters in which he explained how unacceptable to the Palestinians are the so-called autonomy proposals of the Camp David Agreement, and he urged the inclusion of the PLO in negotiations based on acceptance by the people of Israel of the idea of self-determination for the Palestinian people and their eventual right to erect their own sovereign state. He was speaking at a UN forum and in his own capacity, but I would, I mean, it's a very uncommon statement for an international human rights leader person to make then, or even now, actually, I think, for, for many, maybe more. What do you think? Maybe more now, but certainly not then. For its part, Working in the occupied West Bank, Al-Haq only on particular occasions invoked, on principle, the right to self-determination, but it didn't analyze it and did not comment then on the future disposition of the territories. This is for survival, the idea of not doing something that could be accused of being political. So, the organization's rule of law approach focused on the structural violations being perpetrated by the occupying power, Israel, with the aim of securing permanent Israeli control over much, if not most, of the land of the West Bank, including East Jerusalem in particular. This aim was facilitated in the West Bank by the changes made to existing Jordanian law and justice system by Israeli military orders. The founders of Al-Haq were clear that serious violations of civil and political rights and collective punishments such as house demolitions were committed with the aim of reducing resistance by the population to Israel's pursuit of this primary annexationist agenda. In other words, they were clear from the start there was a structural link. You have the agenda and then you have other things that are supplemental to and in order to, to enable the pursuit of that primary agenda. And both the annexationist agenda and the violations of fundamental rights that it entailed and that were carried out in support of it were and are entirely prohibited by international humanitarian law. Here was another challenge for Al-Haq, the question of the law. International human rights organizations then did not address issues of IHL, international humanitarian law. They didn't address IHL as a rule or even at all. Sometimes things were simply out because they were IHL and they weren't human rights law, such as house demolition. IHL was mostly the concern of the International Committee of the Red Cross and military lawyers in different parts of the world, including Israel, which had an expertise on this. There was nothing approaching today's scholarly and practitioner interest in the laws of war. There was a particular gap regarding the application of international humanitarian law after decades of military rule by an occupying power. And in addition, while Israel acknowledged that it was bound by the Hague regulations of 1907, part of customary international law, although again an exception was made for East Jerusalem because of the annexation, Israel had since autumn 1967 formally refused to acknowledge the the, that it was bound by the 1949 Fourth Geneva Convention relative to the protection of civilian persons in time of war, the Fourth Geneva Convention, in defiance of the consensus of the international community. As for human rights law, Israel was not to ratify the two international human rights covenants until 1991, and the extension of this body of law to occupied territories and war zones was not yet a matter of investigation. We hear a lot about that now, but um, as it was back then, the covenants had only just come into force in 1976, so it was all very new. The argument that an occupying power would be bound by its obligations under human rights law had not been made, let alone won, at this point. For Palestine, a landmark in this part of the legal struggle came with the International Court of Justice's 2004 advisory opinion on the legal consequences of the construction of a wall in the occupied Palestinian territory. So, in the absence of... Al-Haq began by mapping the changes made to local law by Israeli military orders and their effect on the Palestinian people's access to their land and livelihoods, and documenting the measures taken against the population by the authorities in response to resistance to that agenda and in a wider policy of intimidation of the population. Both these aspects were critical. One of the major challenges of the time was that, and people, some people here will remember that, at least in the West, Israel had been largely successful in presenting its conduct in the occupied territories as that of a, a benign occupation. It was Raja Shahed, one of the co-founders of Al-Haq, has called it the, the most benevolent occupation in history. And at the same time, there's a quote from a woman who was a representative of Human Rights Watch who told us once that at least in the United States, Palestinian was an adjective qualifying the noun terrorist. The idea of a benign occupation was perhaps the main challenge on the international front during those years. 
When the first intifada erupted in 1987, of course, that image was drastically changed. It was not the same question about getting the information out. It was more about how to, what to do with. So closer to home, human rights activism being unfamiliar then, there were some who questioned whether Al-Haq's work was somehow trying to make the occupation look better. Whether, in fact, what it wanted was a better behaved occupying power rather than an end to the occupation. And whether achieving the first better human rights compliance would reduce the urgency of achieving the second, the end of occupation. It wasn't until the first intifada, in the context of its enforcement project, under the leadership of co-founder Charles Shemes, I'm being careful because he's here somewhere. There he is, Charles. Uh, that Al-Haq articulated the structural argument linking rule of law principles with the end of occupation to show that the logic of the law is otherwise. That is, duly enforced by Israel's co-parties to the convention, other states, the law would serve not to preserve the occupation, but rather both as a holding mechanism for the status of the territories and the rights of the population in the interim, and a facilitative mechanism towards ending the occupation, that is, properly enforced. The law both protects a baseline of rights for the civilian population and underpins the terms of customary international law by rendering an annexationist agenda illegal in and of its own right. Properly enforced, the law ensures that an occupying power has little prospect of gain in prolonging the occupation. It can't have the resources, it can't keep the land. So um, at the same time, the law underpins, um, underpins the sustainability of political dispute resolutions by reducing the likelihood of derailment by serious violations, such as announcement of new settlement plans, um, when processes are ongoing. It's, it's, it's quite a key link to make. You hold a position and make make negotiations possible, and once they're possible, make it sustainable. Explained like this, it seems quite straightforward. I hope yes is the right answer there, but it's okay. It seems quite straightforward. Um, but this argument about the political utility of the law was not uncontroversial at the time. These days, influential commentators, and this is happening now if you're reading the, the, the news, influential commentators call for the prospect of law-based sanction to underpin calls on Israel to desist from its most recent settlement construction plans, this E1 thing around East Jerusalem, announced after the vote on the upgrading of Palestine status at the UN late last year, in the interest of sustaining a new peace process, a new peace process that some say is the last chance for the two-state solution to which the West has in principle committed itself, although in practice it has done very little to protect the prospects for its realization. Al-Haq's voice on the end of occupation is far more direct now than in its early years. Times are different, and the human rights movement itself, in Palestine and outside globally, has different understandings of itself. Shawen Jabarin, as Al-Haq's current director, has criticized human rights organizations that do not address the occupation per se as the occupation, not just what it does, and hold that demands to end the occupation are political. For his part, prominent Israeli human rights lawyer Michael Sfard has rejected the argument made by those he calls human rights neutralists, which is, I quite like that phrase, to the effect that there should be no link between objecting to human rights violations and objecting to the occupation. This is what he argues, the neutralists argue, you shouldn't make that link. In reviewing a work on the role of the Israeli High Court of Justice, Svard addresses the existential dilemma of the human rights lawyer with his question, from the perspective of human rights and of those who seek a quick end to the occupation, was and is the justiceability of the occupation a positive development? In other words, making it possible for passing petitions to go to the Israeli Supreme Court, has that, is that likely to have furthered the work trial? Is that ended furthering work towards any occupation or has in fact sustained it? This goes both to public image and to internal dynamics. Public image of Israel itself, a state of law, and internal dynamics amongst people who choose to go and not. Some petitioners choose not to go. They don't want to give legitimacy to the court. It, this also recalls earlier questions by law professor George Bisharat of UC Hastings as to whether the choices made by Palestinian lawyers to act in the courts of the occupier on behalf of the Palestinian defendants worked in fact to sustain the occupation by drawing energy away from the political struggle and challenging anger into what he called relatively harmless forms. This was a discussion that was going on when there was a lawyer's strike in the 60s and well, the 70s um, in the West Bank, not in Gaza. And this in turn invokes the concern of some that human rights work was a part of a liberal project to, to to tame or defang the Palestinians as a national movement. 
There is something of a consensus that Israel's decision to allow Palestinians from the West Bank and Gaza to petition its Supreme Court for redress, which on balance has been very rarely forthcoming, was due to Israel's investment in its image and its self-perception, importantly, as a state committed to the rule of law. It is also the case that Israel responded and responds with vigor when this proposition of it being a state committed to the rule of law, when this pro proposition is challenged. Sociology professor Lisa Hajar has examined this and other aspects of Israeli rule in occupied Palestinian territories and identifies Al-Haq's first publication, The West Bank and the Rule of Law, by co-founders Shahad and Jonathan Kuteb, and the rejoinder, which is published by the Israeli National Section of the ICJ, the International Commission of Jurists. She says this, this, uh, this, these two publications were the start of a cycle of criticism and rejoinder that would come to characterize the production of knowledge about the legality of Israeli rule. And this, this, this argument, the legal argument, goes on and on. And you can see it in the, oh, sorry. You can see it in the papers. I put my hands down. From the beginning of Al-Haq's work then, it was clear that the Israeli legal establishment would respond vigorously to Palestinian attempts to establish a narrative of the legal and human rights situation in the occupied territories that differed from that of the official Israeli narrative. The very great Stanley Cohen, most recently professor of sociology at the LSE, down the road, the other place as we sometimes call it, or do we not? And in his time, a significant actor in the Israeli human rights movement classified the possibilities of denial by states, including Israel, of human rights abuses according to exactly what is being denied, literal, interpretive, and implicatory. In the second interpretive denial, what he says is that the raw facts, something happened, are not being denied, they're not being challenged. Rather, they're given a different meaning from what seems apparent to others. It's very important. I was going to go back to my book on house demolition, 1001 Homes here, because there's a startling example here, um, also in the first Al-Haq book on that, of Cohen's interpretive denial uh, from a, a, a ruling in, by the Israeli High Court in the mid-80s, which basically held, or the, the quote is much better than I can summarize, but they basically held that house demolition did not, in fact, constitute collective punishment. Um, and I think that's a classic case of interpretive denial, but I thought that instead we might uh, take this moment to pay tribute, I hope this is okay, to pay tribute to Stan, who died here in London earlier this month, and to say that all his friends and admirers here tonight salute him and his work, his brilliance, his passion, he had absolute integrity, and his jokes, and just to say that we miss him, and I'd like to just remember Stan. <laughs> Thank you. By the early years of the First Intifada, Al-Haq was only one of an increasing number of Palestinian human rights organizations in the West Bank and Gaza. It's quite a crowded field now. There's quite a lot, as you'll know, if you keep involved. Um, a very interesting collective work now, so all the dynamics anyway. And indeed, Israeli groups working on human rights in the territories. During this time, there were certain moves on the part of EU states towards a law-based approach to the conflict. They were considering ways of encouraging Israel's compliance with its obligations under international humanitarian law, particularly the forced convention. But as of the spring of 1991, these developments and initiatives were frozen in deference to the US-led political initiative in the region that in 1993 led to the Declaration of Principles and subsequently the Oslo Accords and the establishment of the Palestinian Authority. And in these processes, as Charles Shemes again was wont to say at the time, the sponsoring states and particularly the US seemed to regard international humanitarian law more as an obstacle to the peace process than as a set of norms they were bound to uphold and, to, and potentially as a facilitating mechanism in their, their aspiration to facilitate conflict resolution. Thus, while Israeli settlement policy was and is frequently denounced as an obstacle to the peace process, or the, like now, the prospect of restarting one, so the international norms that prohibit that policy absolutely are for their part found politically disruptive. For its part, the PLO failed to insist on the law as the basis on which political agreements should be negotiated and based, and the Oslo agreements pursuing the arrangements in those first Camp David Accords were, or at least have been treated, as largely international law free. Nor have the guarantors made effective efforts to restrain Israel's pursuit of its annexationist agenda since then. Now, if this sounds like so much history, my point is that Palestinians have contributed to the development and understandings of international humanitarian and subsequently human rights law from an intensely practical position, as well as principled. 
They have asserted their right to claim the protections of the law to which this country, the UK and others, proclaim commitment. And time and again, Palestinians are told, effectively, that they must put aside the law and that they must submit to the existing political balance with the dubious support of EU partners and the even more dubious support of the US as honest broker in their attempts to prevent further encroachments on their right to self-determination, to their livelihoods and the right to live on their own land. In only the most recent example, I'm sure you've all been following the news, Britain, along with other UE states, was reported to have been trying to secure a commitment from the Palestinian political representatives at the UN in return for support at the UN, Britain's support, for the vote on Palestine's upgrading to non-member observer state status, to return so the Palestinians should return to negotiations with Israel without any preconditions, including in regard to settlement construction, and to refrain from seeking membership of the International Criminal Court, since any effort to extend the jurisdiction of this international criminal court over the occupied territories could derail any chance of talks resuming. Palestinian human rights groups objected to any such concession and urged the immediate signature of the court statute by the State of Palestine to strengthen prospects for accountability. And actually, I just saw it this morning that recent reports quote the Palestinian foreign minister suggesting that Israel's recent settlement plans might force their hand on this. Palestinian human rights groups also urged ratification of human rights instruments to bind Palestinian governmental practice. Assam Yunus of El Mizan Human Rights Group and Rafa, but formerly of Al Haq as well, Assam of El Mizan added that Palestine must be clear that justice and law work both ways. When we call for an international court to investigate grave violations of international law and gross violations of human rights in the occupied, in the occupied Palestinian territory, we should expect it to look at alleged violations by the Palestinians. Two issues arise here. The first is that of the exercise of universal criminal jurisdiction over those accused of committing grave breaches of the Fourth Geneva Convention. al haq in fact, had explored this in the late 1980s, since this was and is the only measure of enforcement that state parties to the Convention are under an obligation to take. Everything else is, you've got to try and realise this, but it doesn't say how, what, what measures you have to use to, to, to ensure compliance, or to encourage compliance. And at that time, as I said before, there was really, you can't imagine how bare the field was on these things. There was much less interest, knowledge and activity around the issue of universal criminal jurisdiction than is the case now. But certainly, British officials knew enough even then to studiously avoid referring to grave breach of the convention when committed by Israel. We did have a case in 91 when Iraq, so there was grave breaches, Britain was talking about, they wouldn't talk about it when they were committed by Israel at the same time. It was a, that, was a, that was one of the things, that was a bad moment. It was not until later that moves towards grave breaches prosecutions in third states began in earnest. By the end of the first decade of the 21st century, Networking by activists and lawyers in Palestine, led by the Gaza-based Palestinian Center for Human Rights, and different third states, including here, had become part of what has been termed lawfare. I.L. Weizmann wrote recently that against the background of the UN's Goldstone Report, which came after Israel's Operation Cast Lead in Gaza, 2008-9, so after the Goldstone Report, Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu told an Israeli Security Institute that and I'm quoting, organizations that claim to support the principles of human rights and international law were the third strategic threat to Israel's security. That's third after Iran and Hezbollah. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, I suppose you could talk about impact in this result, I don't know, but anyway, <laughs> as we academics have to these days. When these non-governmental efforts resulted in a near, couple of near misses in London, the British government reportedly assured the Israeli government that Britain would change its law in order to constrain the prospect of Israeli officials being held accountable for their alleged involvement in the perpetration of grave breaches of the Fortune Convention, including during Operation Cast Lead. A similar law-averse position, or rather an aversion to giving any substance to the prospect of legal, of law-based constraint or legal remedy, has been taken by Western states in regard to the recommendations made in the 2004 advisory opinion on the wall that I mentioned before by the International Court of Justice. I could go on, I, I do go on frequently, but I could go on, but the point here is the message it sends about the law. When Palestinians are told repeatedly that international human, humanitarian and human rights law is not properly the framework through which they should seek protection of their lives and livelihood and their land, this message is heard all over the Middle East and indeed beyond. It is not politically naive to suggest there are better messages to send. The second point arising from Eunice's statement is the attention given by Palestinian human rights groups to abuses by their own governing authorities. 
Since the establishment of the Palestinian Authority after the Oslo Accords, groups in Palestine have found themselves confronting challenges more similar to those faced by their Arab counterparts than were and are the particular challenges of confronting the occupation. Strategies vary, of course. In the years before the 2011 revolution in Tunisia, there were regular but extraordinary displays of courage on the part of human rights activists seeking to claim rights from their government. The Tunisia of that time, under then President Ben Ali, was distinguished by the efforts invested by the government in promoting an image of strong commitment to international human rights principles, as well as, very important to Europe, political stability. But human rights advocates and political dissidents at home were subjected to very heavy-handed measures of harassment and repression that sharply contrasted with this carefully cultivated and really vigorously protected image. It was extraordinary. It, the official narrative was exceedingly tightly controlled, and a significant part of that narrative was consisted of stories about the law, and in particular, human rights-related law. Tunisia, Tunisia signed up to everything, was very active in all the four United Nations, but there was this real gap between practice and, and international um, uh, exposure and, and, and dialogue on the subject, if you like. Very interesting, or disturbing, I should say, rather than only interesting. Inside the country, the absence of a forum for public debate on this issue in the media and the rules prohibiting unauthorized meetings, which were quite strict, rendered the courtroom as the site of urgent attempts by defendants and their defense counsel to deconstruct the official narrative and tell stories about the law other than those so carefully constructed and controlled by the state, which included the court record. The judges would say what could go in the court record, and part of the fight was to try and get, for example, the defendants used the word, I was tortured, and the counsel would try to get, put the word torture, and it was, it, it was really... I tended can probably tell, a number of political trials in Tunisia in the 1990s. And I wrote once about how in such a situation, the court may take on even more of the form of a theater than courts usually do. On the one hand, you had the staging of what were in some senses show trials. Well, not least because they seem to primarily to draw the red lines of dissent for a Tunisian audience, the limits of rights and freedoms. On the other hand, defence counsel made their own dramatic interventions, signing on in their scores to speak in defence of the accused or withdrawing individually or en masse to protest at the conduct of the trial. In the trial of one, one human rights activist I attended, there were 40 or 50 lawyers who signed on to act, to speak in defence, act as, as defence counsel. And in a later one, over 100 lawyers turned up, and I think that didn't even include the lawyers from neighboring North African countries who presented themselves in solidarity. It's very hard to convey the sheer physical intensity of the moment when the massed ranks of robed lawyers pressed to the bar, literally pressing forward, when, when the court calls for the naming of counsel for the defense. It's really, it really is an extraordinarily moving moment of collective. It's to witness this moment of collective defiance and solidarity under an extremely repressive regime, as was then. And to understand how some of these people saw their own role, I have one more story from Tunisia, just a month after Ben Ali had departed in 2011, and I was an observer at a meeting between a visiting delegation of MEPs and a group of prominent and, and mostly veteran Tunisian human rights activists. And there was an Italian MEP, and he, I th I th I'm fairly sure that he was from Berlusconi's party, but I might have just projected that out to him, I don't know. <laughs> and he, he sort of gestured around the room at these wonderful people who've been fighting, you know, just around the room and said, where are the youth? We want to meet the youth, you know? And it was, I, I almost walked out, but I wasn't even part of the meeting, but you know, it was, and um, so I didn't, obviously it wasn't, so. Um, there was a woman there, formidable history as a human rights activist, and when it came her turn to reply, Tunisian, well, I can summarize, in summary, she said, we were the resistance, she said. The youth led the revolution, the people are the future. You think, he, he didn't have the grace to look embarrassed, I'm sorry to say, but we were all very moved. So, the human rights activists in the Middle East and North Africa, with whom it has been my privilege to work, are extremely reflective, and they are deeply committed to their own countries and cultures. They are, of course, deeply engaged, perhaps entangled with the West, notably with human rights fora and organizations based in Western Europe and the US, but insistently as peers. These are very complex relationships and they're at least two-way, usually not more, usually more than two-way. And there is a gap in scholarship on the impact of local human rights organizations in the region on their international partners. It tends to be the other way. The relationships ine inevitably involve issues of power and of priorities, of substantive meanings, 
the domestic understandings and transformations of human rights values in specific contexts, the ongoing resonance of colonial legacies, the complications of funding and of donor agendas, and I could go on. Alliances, what I'm saying, are necessarily complex, but they are not unconsidered. Rights work in domestic contexts is equally complex. My friends Abdullahi Naim and Ziba Mir Hosseini both address these matters in their scholarship and in their work, their activism. And I'm aware that I've not actually considered the ongoing work tonight on Islam and human rights, to which they are both leading contributors, if from slightly different approaches. Abdullahi, I should actually note, is the reason I'm at so He was largely responsible for convincing me to, to take up the job offer I had at SOAS, so we can blame him as well. Not that you should attract blame in any means, Abdullahi, I mean that. And I've also not had time tonight to consider the ways in which human rights groups around the region are engaging in what used to be called social issues. Abdullahi Naim wrote a decade ago on what he called the phenomenon of human rights dependency in the Arab world, whereby human rights groups based in the West report in the West on human rights violations in the Middle East and pressure governments in the West to take action with regard to Arab governments, with local human rights actors and indeed Arab populations mostly left out of this equation. I'm not denying the challenges inside the global human rights movement, nor yet the critiques of the power dynamics which are truly manifest in human rights in today's world. I do think, on the first, that the relationship has developed somewhat since Abdullahi wrote that piece. With the strengthening of the human rights movement in the region, networking has become more, diff more easy. I mean, communication, it makes a difference. Vigorous debates between and among them, and intense discuss discussions of strategies and challenges, not least now with everything that's going on in different states in the region. And on the second, on this occasion, I have to say I'm happy to insist that my own government should try at least to do less damage to the idea of human rights and the rule of law than has been the case particularly since 9-11. Palestine is not the only human rights or international law issue in the Middle East, not by any means. However, as I'm here, and while there's no reason whatsoever to think that anybody from the Foreign Office is watching, <laughs> I do never know, it's still worth saying that it would go a long way to supporting these ideas in the region with a frankly substance light approach to Palestinian rights and international law that currently characterizes British engagement with the conflict and has for decades to be replaced with one based more effectively on the fundamental international norms by which this country is in law already bound. What can I say? I'm still angry after all these years, but uh, thank you very much. I'm done. Thank you. Good evening, Assalamu alaikum. My task is uh, brief and beautiful, and I think really very exciting. Uh, I am here to honor Lynn Welshman and to honor Akram Khattab, her husband and partner. Akhui, I tell him. In Sudan, uh, I am from Sudan. In Sudan, we don't say Akhi, we say Akhui, uh, which I think is uh, Hanina, it's, it's more affectionate. So Akram is Akhui and Lin is Ukhti. And this is actually how I see them and I see her work and her passion. We just experienced all of that. This amazing mix of brilliance and passion that she is. Uh, that I, I see her work uh, in terms of what, what my teacher, Ustaz Mahmoud Muhammad Taha, used to call al uh, alayq al insaniya he used to say that, it is in Arabic, I mean, it can't be rendered in translation, but I will say it first and then try to. He says, Al alayq al insaniya hi arfa' ma fil wujud. That human ties are the most supreme in the universe, in the cosmos. And I think that is what Lin is about. It is about these human ties in the quality of her scholarship and the commitment of her heart and passion for the cause of people, 
and relationships to people. Human ties are the most supreme in the universe. So the, the incident that Lynn referred to towards the end of her uh, lecture was about, in 1997, uh, I had already known her for several years and we were working together with the International Council for Human Rights Policy and I used to meet her at various uh, events and at Interrights where she was based at some time. And she came to like a, a fork um, or a, a, a parting ways or a point where she had to decide. Uh, because on the one hand, her, her passion, her commitment are to activism and to human rights uh, promotion in, in the actual on, on the ground. But she was also offered the position uh, here at, 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 at SAWAS and she wanted to decide whether she could go into academia or continue to be an activist. And I said, there is no conflict. In fact, you can be more of an effective activist as an academic than you would be otherwise. And I'm vindicated and I'm really heartened to see that 20 years later almost, I, I can say with all due modesty, I was right. <laughs> So she kept her activism in the most effective way, which is the quality of a scholarship. Because I think poor scholarship doesn't advance any cause. So there is no conflict between true advocacy and true scholarship, because they supplement and complement each other. And in that sense, I think that uh, for those of us who are Puritan sort of scholarly types who think that activism somehow taints uh, scholarship, that is not the case. And the point for me is, what is the point of a scholarship if it is not for social change? I don't think that any of us can afford to be neutral. There is no neutrality. Failure to take a position is a position for the status quo. So th those who think that by just simply keeping silent or burying my thoughts and ideas in sort of layers of, of ambiguity in the writing and third person type of talk uh, as if that they are not taking position. They are taking position for the status quo. And if the status quo is one of injustice, they are taking position for injustice. Those who speak out and speak boldly and, and, and bravely and, and clearly as Lind does, with the quality that is totally integral, that is totally unassailable. I think that is how scholarship and activism come to meet and they have been personified in Lin's personality all the time. And I think that uh, in, in making these remarks, I was thinking how to, I came all the way, by the way, from Atlanta, Georgia, USA last night uh, to honor Lin and Akram. And I think that uh, what I was thinking about, what, what could I say after all that she said, and um, I know Ziba would have said, and so and all of you know, because there are many students here who know her, many colleagues who know her, how could I say it? And just it came to me that I just say it by touching on this anchor of, of human ties as the cause of our very being and our human ties and the way we care for them is what keeps academic institutions of this quality and caliber going. And I think that when, when our scholarship and our commitments lose touch uh, and, uh, and, and concern for actual people's lives on the ground, everywhere, equally, then we are not worth our salt. Thank you very much for honoring Lynn tonight, and I would like to invite her again one more time to meet you all, and thank you.
Don't forget the reception.